As you, as you obviously know, Fidel Castro died on uh, Friday at 10.29 in the evening, local time in, uh, in Havana. And uh, although this event was uh, expected, <laughs> Fidel Castro was very old and uh, had uh, had uh, ill health for a number of uh, years. He stepped down fr formally from his political positions in 2008. Uh, and he had been seen rarely, he had few public appearances uh, recently at the Congress of the Communist Party and so on. But everyone knew that this was uh, coming. But on Saturday I was talking to a comrade in uh, Santiago and he said, listen, we all knew that this was going to happen, it's, in, it's inevitable, it happens to everyone and he had ill, Ill health, but uh, it still came as a shock. And uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the images today from uh, uh, Havana where thousands of people are streaming in uh, Revolution Square paying the last respects to uh, Fidel Castro who played such an important uh, role for many decades in uh, Cuban political life and particularly the Cuban uh, Revolution but this is uh, the same all, all across the, the island. Uh, and I would say it's not just in uh, Cuba, uh, particularly in Latin America, across uh, different uh, countries in Latin America, thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of uh, young people, veteran activists, left-wing activists, revolutionaries, uh, they feel like they lost uh, someone who played a very important uh, role for many uh, years. And we need to try to uh, understand why this is. Uh, and also at the same time, as you've probably seen in your TV screens over here, there are also people celebrating uh, Fidel's uh, death. Uh, in the Spanish TV is a constant non-stop images of uh, Miami, where counter-revolutionary exile uh, Cubans are actually celebrating on the streets. They've been celebrating for two or three days. In uh, Madrid at the weekend there were almost fist fights between groups of uh, supporters and opponents of the Cuban revolution outside the, the embassy. So this is an event which has left no one uh, unmoved or untouched. Uh, but obviously we need to uh, try to understand why, why, this, why this is. Uh, most of the commentary in the media and the main political leaders across the, the world have uh, made statements about the death of Fidel Castro. Some have been more uh, polite and diplomatic, let's say. Some have been more open and brazen in, uh, in, the, in the happiness that uh, Fidel is finally uh, gone from, from their point of view. Uh, but I would say that there, is, uh, the, the, there are reasons why uh, certain uh, people celebrate today and certain people uh, mourn. When uh, uh, Hugo Chavez died a few years uh, ago, not so, not so long ago, Fidel Castro said, if you want to know who Hugo Chavez is, look at who's celebrating or look at who's uh, mourning. And I think the same thing pretty much applies to Fidel, uh, to Fidel, to Fidel Castro. Uh, the reason why the rulers in many countries of the world celebrate today the death of Fidel Castro is because Fidel Castro was for many years a, a representative of a revolution that stood up to uh, US imperialism, that uh, developed the living conditions of the masses to an extent that's not been seen in many other places around uh, the world. And this is also the reason why uh, workers, peasants, youth, uh, left-wing youth across the, the world today mourn the, the death of uh, Fidel uh, Castro, he's uh, passing away. And uh, this can be demonstrated in figures. If you want to make an appraisal of the Cuban revolution, we could be talking uh, for a long time. There are positive aspects, there are negative aspects, but, but it, it can also be summarized in figures. If you look, for instance, at basic uh, indexes of uh, social uh, development, you will see that today life expectancy at birth in Cuba is 79.39 years. It was 62 at the time of the revolution. So the revolution itself and progress over these uh, decades has massively improved uh, life expectancy. But just to give you an idea, life expectancy in the United States today, by the same uh, criteria, is uh, 78.9. Life expectancy is slightly less in the United States, the most powerful capitalist country on the globe, than in Cuba, 
which after all is a small island in the Caribbean with very, very few natural uh, resources, which has been subjected for decades to a blockade, an embargo, by the United uh, States. So that, that is in itself quite significant. In fact, we shouldn't be, uh, if we want to be fair, we shouldn't be comparing Cuba with uh, the United States or Europe. We should be comparing Cuba with neighboring uh, countries in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, very close to Cuba is the island which contains Haiti and the Dominican uh, Republic. Do you know what is the life expectancy at birth in uh, Haiti? Which is an island very similar to Cuba. It's also a Caribbean island, sim similar climate and uh, so on. Uh, and life expectancy in Haiti is only 62 years uh, of age. So there are 16 years of difference uh, between living in a country that's ruled by capitalism and living in a very similar country where capitalism has been abolished. Uh, and this, I would say, summarizes the, 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 the gains of the Cuban uh, revolution. You could give figures like this for many other social uh, indicators. Infant mortality in Cuba is lower, the rate of infant mortality in Cuba is lower than in the United States. Uh, and, and, and it compares favorably also to Europe. This is about the same as in Europe. In Europe, it's slightly uh, uh, better. But it compares very favorably, not only with Haiti, which is, after all, the poorest country in the, in the continent, but with other countries which have developed uh, economies uh, like uh, Argentina, uh, Brazil, Mexico, which are large countries with uh, economic resources and, and so on. But where? where uh, capitalism does uh, exist. There's no other. There's no other significant difference between uh, these two types of uh, countries, and it does. Uh, and it does show. If you if you want to make an appraisal of the figure of uh, of Fidel Castro, you really are making an appraisal of the revolutionary history of uh, Cuba. You need to understand the context in which uh, he uh, was born, in which he grew up, in which he got involved in politics and then in revolutionary uh, politics. Fidel Castro was born in 1926 in a small uh, uh, village. It wasn't even a village. He was born in a, in a, um, in a landed state where there was a small um, uh, settlement where the people who worked in the sugarcane uh, were living. His father was a Galician from Galicia in Spain who had fought against Cuban independence in the War of Independence and then returned and settled in Cuba. And although he arrived in Cuba as a poor man with nothing to his name, he became quite wealthy. And at one point he had about a thousand hectares of land Plus, he was cultivating uh, or, or renting another 10,000. So he, he became quite a wealthy uh, person, Fidel's uh, dad. In, uh, and this was in Biran, in, Biran in, the, in the province of Olguin, in the east of the, of the country. The east, the east of Cuba is also the part of the country that has the, the most deep-rooted revolutionary traditions. All revolutionary movements in Cuba have always started in that region around Santiago and, uh, and so on. Uh, he was uh, as a very young uh, child. He was sent to Santiago to study. Uh, I, w I won't go into all the details of his, uh, of his life, but he, he, uh, he studied after a few years in which he even suffered uh, hunger. But he then was able to study in the best private religious uh, schools in, uh, in uh, Cuba, run by the Jesuits and by La Salle, and uh, first in Santiago and then in uh, Havana, where he did his last years before he go to, went to university. In 1944, he entered university, 1945. Uh, 90, in, in Cuba, Cuba at that time was a country which had uh, only just achieved its formal national independence in 1898 from Spain. Uh, Cuba was the last country in Latin America to achieve uh, independence, or at least formal uh, independence, because uh, uh, it had the misfortune of being the last country to achieve independence from a decaying imperial, uh, imperialist uh, uh, power, Spain, 
uh, at a time when there was already in the region another rising imperialist power, the United States, which is only 90, 90 miles uh, away from the shores of uh, Cuba. And this meant that from the very beginning, Cuba became free from Spain and dominated by the United States. I uh, don't know if you, if you know, but the most graphical demonstration of this domination is uh, the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment is, some, is an amendment that was put in the, in the Cuban Constitution, uh, forced in the Cuban Constitution by the, by the government of the United States, which said that the United States had the right to intervene militarily in Cuba if United States interests were affected. I mean, how, how can you describe that as independence? Uh, anyone who wanted to be the president of, uh, of Cuba had to go first to the US Embassy to seek uh, permission. And the United States dominated the economic and political life of uh, Cuba for the decades that went up until uh, 1945, uh, uh, at the time that you were talking about, when, when Fidel Castro started his university studies and he studied uh, law. A few la later on he actually enrolled in three different uh, uh, degrees but, um, but he, he became interested in, uh, in two things. His first interest in politics came from two different sides. First of all he was considered himself an anti-imperialist uh, of a Latin American character. He was not only interested in the situation of Cuba, but he immediately sympathized with the, with the anti-imperialist cause of all the Latin American peoples. For instance, he became involved in uh, the struggle uh, against, uh, for the return of the Panama Canal to Panama. Uh, he was in, interested in the issue of the Malvinas, the Falkland uh, Islands. Uh, he even participated in 1947 in a failed uh, military incursion in the Dominican Republic where they wanted to overthrow the dictatorship of Trujillo, a dictator had been imposed by the United States. Uh, and then in 1948 he traveled to uh, Colombia to attend a meeting of uh, students, a Latin American meeting of uh, students and he witnessed the events of uh, El Bogotazo, which was uh, the killing of a left-wing radical uh, leader, Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, uh, who was becoming very popular among the workers, the peasants and the progressive layers in, uh, in Colombia. He was assassinated on the 9th of April and there was a massive uprising in which even sex sections of the police participated and so on. He was present and he participated also in that movement. That kind of started to shape his politics. But above all, he was very interested in the history of Cuba and the history of Cuba's struggle for independence and national sovereignty. Uh, the struggle of uh, Jose Martí, and the revolutionary Cuban uh, party. Uh, but, but later on, different way, there had been in Cuba uh, wave after wave of attempts to really free the country from foreign uh, domination. Very heroic and revolutionary attempts. Uh, but Cuba was also peculiar in another way. Many other countries in Latin America fought for independence at the beginning of the 19th century. But Cuba was actually fighting for independence at the beginning of the 20th century. And the, the socio-economic structure of the country was different i.e. there was a very strong working class in, in Cuba, which had not existed, say, in 1810, 1812, in Venezuela, for, for, for instance. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of uh, workers who were working in the sugarcane crop, but there were only seasonal workers for two or three, maybe four months a year, they would work in this uh, crop, and for the rest of the year they were unemployed. Uh, living uh, social conditions were terrible in uh, Cuba. Many people had no uh, homes, many people had no uh, degree of literacy uh, at all. Um, and Cuba was de facto the brothel and the casino of the United States. I don't know if you've seen the, the movie El, uh, The Godfather. Uh, there is a scene where all the different mafia families from the United States meet in Cuba and they have a, a cake in the shape of the island uh, uh, profile 
and they cut this cake amongst the different uh, families as uh, they actually cutting the interest in the, in the, in the island. And th this is not just a film, it's actually the reality of Cuba in, in the 1930s and 1940s. This very strong uh, workers' movement had originally an anarcho-syndicalist uh, tradition at the turn of the century, the beginning of the 20th century. And then in 19, uh, early 1920s, they formed the Communist Party of Cuba, which was set up by different people, including some who had fought with uh, Martí in the struggle for independence. It's also interesting to know that Martí based his revolutionary party amongst the workers, mainly the tobacco uh, workers in Tampa, in Florida, but also in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, and Carlos Baliño, who had been a part of the revolutionary uh, Cuban party with Martí, went on to form the Communist Party in 1924, together with uh, Julio Antonio Mella, a uh, young student uh, leader, uh, whose, not very, whose story is not very well known. He died very young. In 1929, he was assassinated by, uh, by order of the Machado, Machado, the dictator of Cuba. And they established the Communist Party, which went on to have a big influence in the workers' uh, movement. But then in the 19, late 1920s and early 1930s, there was, there was also very strong left opposition. Uh, the followers of Leon uh, Trotsky were very uh, uh, powerful in the island and they had a very strong influence in the workers' movement, particularly in Guantanamo and in, uh, and in Santiago, in the eastern uh, uh, provinces, where they controlled the local uh, uh, workers' federations, Federación uh, Obrera de Guantanamo, Federación Obrera de Santiago. Um, in 1933, not commonly known, there was a revolutionary general strike in uh, Cuba against the dictatorship and there were, there were Soviets, in fact, in the sugar cane uh, plantations, the Soviets uh, lasted for months. The workers had taken over the haciendas, the, the landed states, and they had control of the situation for many months. Th this uh, general strike was derailed. Uh, but, but also gave rise to a very left-wing, short-lived left-wing government in the 1933-34, uh, the government of the 100 days of Grau San Martí. And in this government of Grau San Martí, there was another very important revolutionary figure, Antonio Guiteras, who uh, was the leader of an organization called uh, the Student Left Wing, the Ala de Izquierda Estudiantil, and then went on to form another organization called La Joven Cuba, the Young Cuba. And he also uh, mixed the ideas or the, the struggle, revol revolutionary strategy was to fight for national liberation and also social liberation. He considered himself a socialist and he understood that the two tasks went together. Same ideas as uh, Julio Antonio uh, Mella. And uh, the, this was the situation in the 1930s. And there was a military coup, the first military coup of Fulgencio Batista, whom we will find uh, later on. By 1945, as uh, Fidel was starting to get involved in politics, there was a whole generation of uh, people in the university, young, young university students. And you have to understand that most university students at that time in Cuba came from middle class and upper class families. Working class families couldn't send the kids to, to university, they couldn't uh, afford it. Uh, uh, and, but nevertheless, they were becoming very radical. Uh, they were becoming close to the workers' movement uh, as well, but they were not attracted by the Communist Party uh, because the Communist Party had followed the Stalinist policy of uh, popular frontism and then later on the Stalinist policy of democracy against fascism in the Second World War. And this in Cuba in particular meant that the Communist Party was part of the 1940 uh, Batista government. Batista was in power from 1940 to 1944 and the Communist Party was part of this government. Why? Because Batista was on the side of democracy, i.e. US imperialism, in the Second World War and therefore the Communist Party was instructed by Stalin to join that government. All the democratic forces had to join uh, together in that government. Despite the fact that Batista was, uh, had been a dictator, had been responsible for repression of workers, students and was hated in uh, Cuba. For this 
reason, many young people, uh, actually the Communist Party had two ministers in the Batista government in 1940, in 1940 uh, Juan Marinello and Carlos Rodriguez. And uh, so for this reason, many young revolutionaries did not uh, immediately become attracted to the, to the Communist uh, Party, but on the contrary, they were repelled. Uh, they, they might be interested in socialist ideas and so on, but they didn't join the Communist Party. And they joined all sorts of other movements. Uh, Castro, Fidel Castro started his political life as part of the youth of the Orthodox Party, party formed by a senator called uh, Chivas. And Chivas was one uh, person who was denouncing the corruption of the government and he wanted clean politics, uh, return to republican values and so on. So his program wasn't particularly radical, he just wanted uh, clean, to clean up politics. Uh, and, and Fidel Castro was part of the youth of this uh, movement. Chivas uh, uh, killed himself, committed suicide in, 19, in early 1950s and uh, the party became disorganized. By 1953, 1953, Batista was about to lose the elections and he organized a coup. So uh, in, 19, in 1952, sorry, no, in 1950, no, in 1950, uh, and anyway, either in 1952 or 1953, Batista organized, uh, in 1952, uh, Fulgencio Batista carried out his second coup. Uh, and this triggered this group of revolutionary youth, there were many of them, but the one that uh, Fidel was uh, organized in, decided that they had to do something, that they had to take action that will trigger a mass movement and bring down this dictatorship. And, and, uh, and so they did. They organized a group of a few hundred uh, young uh, men and uh, women. They armed, they, they, they got arms in different uh, ways. And they decided to, uh, to attack the Moncada barracks of the army in uh, Santiago. And their idea was not uh, necessarily that they were going to immediately bring down the, the government by themselves, but rather that they were going to spark a mass movement, uh, a revolutionary insurrectional strike, uh, by making an appeal, by making a, a bold stance and then making an appeal to the, to the masses. Now that failed, this was in, uh, in July 26, 1953, uh, the attempt failed, uh, half of the people involved were captured, about 55, all of those captures were tortured and killed with very brutal uh, methods. Uh, Castro managed to uh, escape and he was uh, finally arrested and he was put on trial and he used this uh, trial to defend himself, he was a lawyer, uh, and he used his trial to defend himself and he made speech from the dock, which was then became known as the history will absolve me, in which he explained the reasons why they had carried out that uh, action. And it was very effective, very effective way of using uh, the, the, the public tribune to explain your, your ideas. And they couldn't uh, prevent him from doing uh, so. And so he explained what was the program of the M26 of July uh, movement, M267 movement, that, uh, that he became, became the, the leader of. And, and the, the program, if you look at it, is not particularly uh, radical or, or, or let's say it's not, it's not a communist or anti-capitalist program. They, they had four or five basic demands. One, the restoration of the 1940 constitution. Uh, two, agrarian reform. Uh, three, the participation of industrial workers in company uh, profits, having a share of company profits, the participation of sugarcane uh, colonos, a uh, small uh, peasant uh, and rural laborers in the profits of the sugarcane uh, crop. Uh, and also the confiscation of the holdings of those who had been involved in corruption in previous governments. It's uh, just basically they wanted the rule of uh, law, republican law, to be reinstated in, uh, in Cuba. It's not particularly, it doesn't seem particularly radical and it's certainly not a, a communist or socialist program by any stretch of imagination. Uh, finally, Castro was uh, released, was uh, amnestied by uh, Batista and he, and he fled into exile in Mexico with the idea of organizing an expedition, uh, a group of uh, men to go back, disembark in Cuba and again 
try to spark revolutionary movement against the dictatorship. This was, uh, if you think about it, a bit of a crazy idea. They had a boat, the Gramma, which held about 50 people, but they crammed 82 uh, people on this uh, boat. Many of them had never been at sea before. They got uh, seasick and uh, they managed to finally cross over to uh, uh, Havana, to, to Cuba, and in the last days of 1956, uh, the anniversary is this uh, Saturday, I think, on the 3rd of uh, December, they finally disembarked in the province around uh, Santiago. The disembarkment was uh, late, two or three days later than expected. Therefore, the actions that were supposed to take place in Santiago in, in conjunction with the disembarkment didn't take place on time. They were all uh, ambushed and many of them were captured. Out of the 82 people who participated in that disembarkment, only 12 remained uh, free. The rest were either captured or killed by the forces of the, of the Batista regime. And these 12 people embarked on a guerrilla war. They went into the mountains of Sierra Maestra. And in less, in just over two years, two years later, Batista had uh, been forced to flee the country and the revolution had uh, triumphed. This might seem uh, completely uh, unexpected. And, uh, uh, and in fact, you could say that they were a bit, um, that they were a bit um, daring or even mad if you, if you want. But they, they had an ideal and they wanted to do something in order to implement it. And why is it that they, they, in such a short space of time, they managed to defeat the Batista army, which had the backing of the United States and the capitalist class and the landowners and the imperialist companies and so on? The reason is that uh, the regime was so rotten and so hated that the action of a small group of uh, people triggered a, a chain reaction. It was not just the guerrilla war in the mountains, which involved no more than 500 people throughout the whole process and perhaps up to 2,000 right at the end in the last few uh, weeks. But it was also a movement in the underground in the cities. Uh, middle class people, lawyers, university professors, uh, journalists and so on who hated the regime and started to organize in different organizations, Acción y Sabotaje and other organizations in the, in, the, in, the, in the cities. And there was also a very strong workers movement. This is not generally known, but in 1957 there was a revolutionary general strike under a dictatorship in uh, Santiago when the police killed Frank Pais, one of the main leaders of the underground in the cities. In 1958 there was another revolutionary general strike in uh, April. There was a congress of workers in the, in the Sierra Maestra that organized the workers to fight against the dictatorship. And finally, on the first day of 1959, January 1st, 1959, Batista was forced to flee the country, and he attempted to leave behind another government, someone from the regime, but it wasn't uh, as tainted as him, in order to give some continuity to the same uh, regime. Uh, Fidel Castro and the guerrillas were far away from Havana when, uh, when Batista fled, and they decided to declare a revolutionary general strike in Havana in order to prevent the formation of another regime another continuity regime. And the revolutionary general strike lasted for eight days. The workers came out, the population came out, and they took over the police stations, they controlled the situation in the capital, until the guerrillas, in this case led by Cienfue Camilo Cienfuegos and uh, Che Guevara, who were closer in Santa Clara, arrived in the capital a few days later, on the 8th of uh, January. Fidel, Fidel was in uh, Santiago in the meantime, leading a different uh, guerrilla column, and didn't arrive in the capital until a few days uh, later. So you can see that it, was, it wasn't just a small band of guerrillas, but one, the revolutionary policies that they followed, everywhere they went, they gave the land to the peasants, so they started implementing the program of agrarian reform, and this completely destroyed the basis of the Batista army, which was a conscript army made up of uh, the sons of uh, agricultural uh, workers and uh, workers in the cities and poor uh, people who, when they saw they were fighting against people who were giving them the land, they uh, fled, they deserted, and the whole army uh, collapsed uh, eventually. Now, as I said, uh, and I'll have to skip a few things here because this is going a bit uh, uh, slow, but they came to power in 1959, uh, January, 
and they had carried out the revolution. Their attempt, their, their intention was not to abolish uh, capitalism, they were not socialists. Some, of, some amongst the guerrillas had already socialist ideas at that time, <laughs> particularly Che Guevara, for instance, and uh, Raul Castro, who had been a member of the socialist uh, youth, the youth of the Communist Party. But the general uh, politics of the M26-7 uh, was not socialist at all. In, in fact, it included quite a lot of bourgeois elements who were anti-communist. Uh, th this was at the beginning of the Cold War, after, after all, if you, if you remember. Uh, the first president of uh, Cuba was, uh, they had two presidents, Dorticos and uh, Urrutia, and they were bourgeois people, respectable uh, people. They, they put there in order to uh, appease the bourgeoisie and appease uh, the United States. They didn't want a, a confrontation. But what happened was that as soon as they started to implement agrarian reform in a serious uh, way, in a law that was drafted by uh, Che Guevara, then obviously the, the interests of the big capitalists and the landowners started to be touched and they immediately organized a counter reaction to this. There was a constant coup and counter coup in which, for instance, the United States, the, 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 the Cuban revolutionary government expropriated some landed states that belonged to US owned companies that controlled the sugar cane crop. And then the United States said, OK, we're not going to buy, purchase the sugar cane crop from Cuba anymore which was the main uh, uh, customer of, of, the Cuba, of the Cuban sugar. And so then the, the Soviet Union stepped in and said, okay, we're gonna buy it. And then uh, the United States said, okay, if you touch any more companies, we're, not gonna, we're gonna instruct the oil refineries, which were all in the hands of the United States companies, Shell and other companies. Uh, uh, then they, they said, we're gonna instruct them not to refine oil. And then the, the, the Soviet Union said, okay, we're gonna send you oil. And the government said, okay, we're gonna intervene, not nationalize at the beginning, but intervene these companies. The government had promised, for instance, to decrease uh, the price of uh, electricity and telephone uh, tariffs. But these were two US-owned monopoly, mono monopolies, uh, the American Telecom and, and Telephone Company and another company that controlled the electricity. Uh, and so as soon as they started intervening, they had to, uh, they, 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 they clashed with US uh, interest. And, and in a very short space of time, by nationalizing all those companies that were sabotaging the economy and by implementing thorough agrarian reform, they realized that they had uh, basically abolished capitalism uh, without necessarily wanting to do so, just as, as in the form of defensive measures. It was a very, very short space of, uh, of time in which all this happened. In uh, April 1961, you probably know there was the, the attempted invasion of Bay of, uh, Bay of Peaks uh, invasion. Uh, the, the, the Playa Giron, and they uh, b basically was a US funded and organized invasion of the island uh, carried out by counter-revolutionary elements from uh, Cuba. These people were the actual owners of uh, companies, uh, factories, uh, landed states and so on, that they went on a number of boats with the support of the United States and attempted to invade the island. On, on the eve of the invasion, Fidel Castro declared the socialist character of the, of the revolution. Capitalism had been uh, uh, abolished. And on this basis, they were able to achieve all these uh, gains of the revolution. This, this is, I would say, maybe the most important point that we need to, to understand. That it was only on the basis of the abolition of capitalism that there could be any progress in, uh, in Cuba. And the national independence, I, the development of their own economy could only be carried out by expropriating multinational foreign companies, which were all US owned. And once they were expropriated, there was no capitalism uh, uh, anymore. Uh, now, I, I won't have time to explain everything I wanted to, but, but I will just say a few uh, things. First of all, the, the, uh, the revolution took place in a very small island. Uh, as I said, 90 miles from the United States. And the United States immediately, in 1962, imposed an, an embargo and a blockade of the economy. So, so in stepped the Soviet Union. This was time of the, of the, of the Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union had not wanted the revolution in Cuba, had not advised the Cuban revolutionaries to carry out the expropriation of capitalism. On the contrary, they were, they were against. Uh, in fact, the, the Cuban Communist Party was all the time advising uh, moderation, caution, do not provoke imperialism and so on. Uh, but, but once the revolution was uh, in motion, they supported it. So this, for a period of 30 years, 
was on the one hand a very positive economic uh, relationship because the Soviet Union b purchased sugar and, uh, uh, Cuban sugar at prices which were above the prices of the world market and sold other products, industrial uh, products, machinery and consumer goods to Cuba at prices that were below the world market, i.e. precisely the opposite of an imperialist uh, relationship. But at the same time, th there was a negative side to this, because in 1950s, 60s, in, Q in the Soviet Union, there wasn't a socialist democracy or workers' democracy by any stretch of imagination. There had been a, a Stalinist counter-revolution, and this also wrapped off into the Cuban uh, revolution, particularly after the first phase. In the first phase, the Cuban leadership attempted to uh, uh, trace their own course. They wanted to spread the revolution to other countries. We can talk about this uh, later if you want in the discussion. But uh, by, 1970, by, by early 1970, they had been defeated. Uh, Fidel uh, Che Guevara had been killed in uh, Bolivia in 1967. All the attempts to uh, trigger revolutions in other countries had failed for one reason or another that uh, we don't have time to enter, and the revolution had become isolated and much more dependent from the Soviet uh, Union. 1971-76 uh, uh, was the five grey years. There was repression of anyone who had different uh, ideas in the fields of the arts, uh, the economy, um, social sciences, there was, uh, as, you, as you probably uh, heard, there was repression of, there was homophobia was um, uh, institutionalized. Homophobia obviously existed before the revolution, but by, by 1970-71 it became institutionalized in, uh, in, the, in the new uh, uh, setup. Uh, and, and this was very uh, negative. Uh, development for the Cuban uh, revolution because it stifled uh, debate, participation and so on. That doesn't mean that uh, the, the Cuban government stayed in power through repression. That's uh, silly. No government can stay in power for 30 years only through uh, repression. On the contrary, the, go the government in Cuba had mass popular support uh, because it had carried out the revolution, A, and B, because this revolution had uh, given people concrete material gains that, uh, that we just uh, described. Education, healthcare, housing, uh, uh, many things that you couldn't find in any other Latin American country, you could find in a revolution. And also something which is not material, but is a very important uh, factor, which is a, a deep feeling of national sovereignty, of independence, of standing up, to the strongest imperialist power, uh, which was just 90 miles uh, away from the shores of uh, Cuba. And this is what allowed not, not only the resistance of the Cuban Revolution, but particularly the resistance of the Revol Cuban Revolution after the fall of the Soviet Union in 89-91. They, they were left with nothing. Uh, all the trade had been disrupted, and it was a very, very, very difficult period, which is known as the Special uh, Period. And they survived through that. But uh, just to finish, today there are dangers that affect the Cuban uh, revolution. I will say there's two main ones, uh, and this we need to take into, into account in order to make a balance. The first one is that there are sections, <coughs> quite clearly, in the leadership <coughs> of the Cuban uh, revolution who think, who are toying with the idea, of what is known as the Chinese way or the Vietnamese way, i.e. market reforms that eventually, allegedly, will give rise to economic growth. This is driven by desperation, the very desperate situation of a, of a blockaded small island uh, uh, with very few natural resources. Uh, but I think this is dangerous because uh, in China, if you look at it, what you have now is capitalism, and the restoration of capitalism in China has uh, meant, yes, this economic uh, growth, very impressive economic growth, this massive inequality, the destruction of the conquests of the revolution, like public health care, the pension system, the education, and everything. This same thing will happen in uh, Cuba, which will be a massive uh, disaster. And at the same time, this massive over-exploitation of the working uh, class. This is the basis for the Chinese economic uh, miracle. And the second danger, I will say that exists in Cuba is the new tactics that Obama has started to implement. Obama has changed his tactics. As you can see, mm, mm, diplomatic relations have started to be reestablished, and uh, they basically realized that their previous tactics have failed. They have failed 
to destroy the revolution by direct confrontation. And when I'm talking about direct confrontation, I'm not talking about uh, small fish. I'm talking about 600 different plots to assassinate uh, Fidel Castro, uh, terrorist attacks, invasion, propaganda, the funding of counter-revolutionary groups in, uh, inside Cuba, and a constant, a, a part and on top of the economic blockade and embargo, which is uh, completely dest destroying for the uh, economy. Uh, and they have decided to use different tactics to achieve the same aims, which is the restoration of capitalism and the destruction of the revolution in Cuba. And the different tactics is the tactics of opening up uh, relations, opening up trade, and opening up the penetration of uh, the world market into this very small uh, and, we and weak uh, economy. Right now, uh, the first measure that Obama took was to liberalize the amount of dollars that families can send back to their relatives in uh, Cuba, the remittances. So instead of $100, it's now uh, up to $400, and they want to increase it even more. Now, for, the problem is that because of the very low productivity of labor in Cuba, $400 is a lot of money in Cuba, and, and it's already started private accumulation of capital. And as private accumulation of capital develops, there will be a section of the population in Cuba that will have their own interest, their own material interest, to restore capitalism. People who before, uh, when everyone had one, one house, uh, and these houses are now in a state of disrepair because of the economic situation and so on, uh, but, but now there will be people who will have five, ten, 20 houses become big, la big uh, landlords, while other people will have no homes and they will go homeless, which is something that had not existed up until now in uh, Cuba. And this is also very dangerous. What is the solution to this? In my opinion, just to finish, because the, the chairperson here is uh, kicking me under the table. Um, just to finish, to say that, that in my opinion, there's only two things that can save and defend the Cuban revolution, which, which in my opinion must be done. Uh, the, the conquest of the revolution are very precious and must be defended. And the capitalists and imperialists are now uh, frothing in the mouth that now that Fidel is dead, even though he wasn't playing such a big role uh, because of his illness more recently, but now that he's dead, this process will accelerate of capitalist restaurant. You can see it in, in the declarations. The, the only way to revert this is one, by introducing genuine workers' democracy, i.e. the participation of the workers and the population in general in the running of politics and the economy in Cuba, which now doesn't uh, uh, exist, uh, and two, the spreading of the revolution to other countries. Revolution cannot be isolated in one uh, country. It cannot. I mean, capitalist system is a worldwide capitalist system and uh, it affects everywhere in the world. Unless the revolution spread, the revolution will eventually uh, uh, collapse. And I will say that this is the best uh, homage we can pay to the Cuban revolution and the figure of uh, Fidel that has been so closely associated with it. The struggle for socialism internationally and the participation in the debates that are taking place now amongst Cuban uh, revolutionaries inside the Cuban uh, revolution about what is the way uh, uh, forward. Just to say this, while some who have no uh, interest in human rights and now talking about human rights in Cuba, human rights in Cuba. The, pe the people who flew the, the, the national flag in Britain at half mast when the Saudi king died and who were selling arms to the Saudi regime, they're now talking about human rights in Cuba. They're not interested in human rights, don't worry about that. They're interested in their ability to exploit the Cuban uh, people and to exploit the resources of, uh, of, the, of the island. While they are uh, happy and pleased about this, we, uh, I will say, we should uh, recommit ourselves to the defense of the Cuban revolution. And, and, uh, and this involves the struggle for the transformation of society, for, for an ending to the capitalist system, not only in Cuba, but around the, around the world.